In this lecture, we're going to talk about different types of memory. So there are several kinds of memory, ways to store information on a computer or other digital systems. And in this lecture, we're going to introduce several different kinds. We'll talk about some of the benefits of certain types. We're going to start with the read-only memory, or ROM. And this is a way that large arrays can be stored. Um, you can store some binary data. You can store some files. And it's short for read-only memory, which means you generally cannot write back to it. Um, so once it is written, it is not easily able to be rewritten. Um, you generally just read back from it. So this is a good place to store things like lookup tables, if you need to store some data values, you can store things like serial numbers for particular components. Um, generally, in order to modify it, you have to shut down the system or you have to go through some special kind of um, reconfiguration routine. Um, it is non-volatile, which means that when the power is turned off on a system, it does not lose its contents. It's going to remain, or it's going to retain what it had on there. So it's good for, like we said, a lookup table. So if, let's say you're storing chemical information and you needed to store some data sheets or you needed to store some binary information or um, some old cartridge type games are a good example of ROMs. Um, it's used to store the code that is used in microcontrollers, so in that case you're generally not going to be wanting to write over that code, so you're going to just want to execute the code that is already in there. Um, you can store some identifying information, so if you had a laptop and it came in for service, let's say all of the stickers were gone, all the serial numbers were off of there, you could store actually on some non-volatile memory inside some information on that particular component. And of course ROM is used in our familiar optical storage devices such as DVDs and CDs that you buy in the store. Blu-ray DVDs as well as regular. There's double-sided that allow you some even more uh, storage space and then the traditional single-sided data and music CDs as well are examples of types of ROMs. So how does a ROM work? It's basically a lookup table where you have some address lines that are used to select which particular word you're interested in and then there are data lines to pull back that particular data word. So in this case we have an eight word uh, ROM. This is a very small ROM and it, each word has four bits each. So you can select one of eight using these three select lines here very similarly to a multiplexer um, just put in a 0, 0, 0, and you get whatever the entry is in the 0th location. And This particular data is just one typical example. This uh, has no rhyme or reason for why this is here. This is just an example from your textbook of how things could be stored. So you could just think about populating a table with certain 1s and zeros, and perhaps this sequence or this particular location might uh, make some sense in terms of the records that you're trying to store. So the number of input lines determines how many addresses you can read from. So in the previous example we only had eight locations, so we only needed three address lines. Two to the n for n input lines uh, words can be stored. And so if you had let's say 1024 words you would need 10 input lines so that 2 to the 10 words could be stored. And then M output lines, generally those are powers of 2, but they may not be. Um, but that is the size of the data that you can store in there. Um, in the microcontroller that we use in our microprocessors class here, we actually have 8,192 lines of uh, code that can be stored in there. So in that particular case, you need uh, 2 to the 14 um, entries in, in that particular microcontroller. So you have 14-bit addressing. And each of the entries in there is um, an opcode so that the number of bits for each opcode is how many output lines you happen to have. 
And this will vary depending upon the architecture of your system. So if you had 64 bits, that obviously would allow you to access a very large ROM and those types of things, but it just depends upon how much storage you need. Here is one particular way that you can access the insides of a ROM. So you might have a decoder, and that decoder might just activate one particular line in the array. So you might think about the array as being a grid where you've got two to the n words, and you're picking which one of those you want, and that accesses the m output lines that come on out. So here are how some of these internal connections work. So in this case, you can think about each of these as being switching elements and they can either be attached or not attached and so in that case if you have them attached then when your 3 to 8 decoder here activates this particular line then that is going to put a 1 here it's going to put a 1 over there so in this case this would be your 1 there's no connection here, so that's a zero because it's attached through a resistor to ground. Then you'd have a one here, and then you'd have a zero over there. So wherever you have one of these switching elements in this particular circuit, you would get a logic one. And where you don't have one of these switching elements, you would get a logic zero. And so basically what happens when you store data onto a ROM, you are basically burning in these switching elements, either leaving them in there or burning them off, and that's creating where your ones and your zeros go. So when people talk about burning a CD or burning a DVD, what they're really doing are fusing in these switching elements, and that works with this internal decoder. So in this case, this function, F0, that's this output right here, would either be would be a 1 for either M0, right here, M1, M4, or M6. And you can do a similar function for F1. So F1 would be M2, or M3, or M4, or M6, or M7. So wherever you have a switching element, you can think about that being like putting it into an OR gate right there. So data storage is typically based on some kind of a truth table. So you might have ones and zeros for different functions, so you can store several different functions in there. Um, you might have an entire byte of data coming out or several bytes of data coming out in each word. Um, but every address has to have something. Um, in some cases you may not access it, but you have to realize that something will be stored there. Um, but if you want complete coverage, what you might do is just blank out the ROM at the beginning, make everything all zeros or all ones, and then go back and fill in the switching elements as appropriate. So in the next slide, we're going to talk about how to make a lookup table for ASCII code that corresponds to our hex digits there. So in this particular case, you've got 4-bit input, and so 4-bit binary between 0 and 15, or hexadecimal 0 through F, and in this case, this is going to look up the ASCII code for each of those digits. So the ASCII code for 0 is going to be 0110000, or 30 hexadecimal, 31 hexadecimal for the printable character 1, 32, 33, 34, all the way up through 39. And then what you'll notice is once you get to the letter A, there's actually a skip in the table because there's some other characters in between 9 and A and then it starts over at capital A and then values go in sequence A, B, C, D, E, and F. And so in this case we can notice that there are a few patterns that show up. For all of these values that are less than 9 they all start with 0, 1, 1. And then down here for all of the values 10 or greater, they start with 1, 0, 0. And the nice thing about this is that those happen to just be complements of one another. And so we can use that pattern to our advantage when we're trying to come up with the control logic. So in this particular case, what we might have is our four bits of input coming in here 
and we wouldn't need to have this many different outputs here. We could just have one, two, three, four, five outputs, and then realize A4 and A5 are always the same. Notice that here? A4 and A5 are always the same. And then A6 happens to always be the complement of whatever A4 and A5 are. So in this case, we can just tie A4 and A5 together and then just complement that for our A6 output. And so in that case, we can actually save on a ROM chip. So instead of having to put out all seven bits, we could really just output only five. Now that really only works for this particular example. If you wanted a full uh, lookup table for some other values, of course you would have to have more ASCII's, ASCII values represented. This particular pattern wouldn't hold true. But for zero up through capital F, it does indeed hold true and you can save on some of those output lines. So with four bits of input, you have 16 possible combinations. And so that is the same thing in terms of 0 through 9 and A through F. We have 16 combinations there. And in this case, we'll just put an X where those outputs would be a 1. So for 0 through 9, remember that our A4 output was a 1. We can go back and see that here. So for 0 through 9, A4 was a 1. And then for our other places where we see zeros, we have zeros here, 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 and there. So we're seeing that same pattern filled in. Where we see ones, we see these x's showing up here. Notice that in our least significant bit, we alternate every other one until we get down here. This is that 9 to A transition, and then we go back into this alternating pattern. So this allows us to determine where our ones are going to be. So ROMs come in several different varieties. Some are mass programmable. This is like the DVDs or CDs that you might buy at the store. If they have your favorite movie on them, you generally only burn them once, and then you cannot overwrite them later on. So if you wanted a different movie on there, you'd have to go buy another DVD. So that DVD is written once with some kind of a mask, typically in an optical uh, burning process. Um, you also may have programmable read-only memories. Uh, so in that case, these might be on chips. And so you typically have to go through some kind of an erasure process to get the data off of them. In the olden days, that was actually done with ultraviolet light. Nowadays, most rewritable read-only memories go through some kind of an electrical process. So these are uh, chips that can go through processes as well as uh, CDRWs or DVDRWs that can be rewritten. So sometimes these are done in circuit, sometimes you actually have to pull them out and put them into another uh, rewritable system to allow you to uh, change the configuration of data on there. So this is an example of an old style ROM chip. Notice this window on here is what allowed ultraviolet exposure. So in the olden days you would program this by taking it, blanking it, by putting this in an ultraviolet bath. It's almost like a tanning bed for a chip. And then when you wanted to run it, you would just put a simple sticker over the top of this, and that would keep any ultraviolet light from blanking your data. And then when you wanted to rewrite it, you just pull the sticker off, put it back in a UV bath, and let it sit there for a while. Once it's uh, completely erased, then you could put it into uh, some kind of a socket and have it reprogrammed and then put it back into your circuit. RAM. Every computer that you buy has RAM. This is what allows you to store uh, temporary data, intermediate calculations, things like your uh, most recent browser access, and uh, unsafe changes to any kind of word processing documents or productivity that you might have. Um, this is good for fast access. So as you're changing things, uh, RAM is much faster to access than ROM, so it's great for temporary information like a current state in a game that you might be playing, all those types of things. The problem with RAM is that it is volatile, and so if the power goes out, everything that is in RAM that is not backed up to another kind of storage does go away. 
So flash memory is also obviously very popular uh, with thumb drives and various other flash storage utilities. This is nice, it's non-volatile, so you can carry your files around on your keychain without having to put a battery in there. That allows you to transfer files very easily. And this is written to and read from serially using a USB port or universal serial bus. So what this means is inside each of these flash drives you just have a USB interface and the USB port really just has four lines for data unless you're talking about the new USB 3.0 standard but for USB 1 and USB 2 you just have four lines and two of those are for your data one of those is for the power or the 5 volt line and the other is your ground reference so all of your data is just sent over one of those data lines or uh, read back from one of those data lines as you're trying to read a file and of course those come in nice packages like this where you can just put your thumb on this and retract your USB so you've got some nice packaging for that particular memory Traditional hard disks look something like what you see here to the right. Data is stored on platters, and those platters spin around like an old record player. And a read head, like you see on here, goes around and locates your data. So your hard drive knows that that data is stored at some particular location, so it can use a little motor to send that read head in or out, and then another motor to spin this particular uh, disk platter so that it gets to the right place. Solid state drives are largely replacing a lot of the traditional hard drives. The good news about this is that they don't have moving parts and they are much faster so you don't have to spin up motors. They generally uh, consume less energy, uh, consume less power than uh, using traditional hard drives because you don't have to spin those motors. They're fast but they are a little bit more expensive. Um, there's a good article if you download the PowerPoint here and uh, just click on this link, pcmag.com. Uh, you see the, the link coming up there. That talks about the difference between how solid state drives and traditional hard drives work. So this is really where a lot of the industry is going as people want to make sure their hard disks don't fail. Solid state drives are much more reliable than traditional hard drives. And of course most people are familiar with SD storage. Um, larger storage like this typically used in digital cameras or video cameras and the smaller uh, storage like this micro SD card right here is typically used inside of smartphones and other memory storage devices. A lot of times these are also used uh, for GPS navigation systems in cars. That's what uh, stores the map uh, databases so that your GPS knows where the different roads are and other information. And so they come actually in three different sizes. There's full size, there's mini, and there's micro. So these are the full size. This is a micro and mini is somewhere in between those two sizes. There's also different classes that depend upon how fast data can be stored to them. And so in some cases uh, you see right here, this is a class 2, that's an older, cheaper memory card. Um, that's all about how fast things can go. So class 2 is down at 2 megabytes per second transfer rate. And that goes up to class 10, 10 megabytes. Um, and then there's also a UHS class, which is ultra high speed. And that allows you to send up to 30 megabytes per second. That's good for high definition video and things like that. Um, you also have various capacities. So in the old days, you could only store up to 2 gigabytes. Then they came out with the SDHC. So these are the HC here. Those are good for storing things like video because it allows you to store more on there. This is some of the original storage type, and that only goes up to 2 gigs. So HC has capacity up to 32 gigabytes and then extended capacity now you can even store up to two terabytes of information on an SD card. SD cards are similar to flash memory. It is a solid state type of memory and the data is transferred serially which means one bit at a time through a sequential circuit. 